Mexico, where I work first in product and now marketing. And it's in between here, I met Martin. Uh, we were uh, geeking together on uh, uh, Sketch uh, plugins, and uh, it was uh, it was fun years. We were actually attending meetups and so on. Then uh, we got kids and all that. Um, yeah, so that's me in a very super short uh, shell. Yeah. So do it as, as quickly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're both foreigners, we're both uh, immigrants. Uh, I'm from Iceland, so I started my career in East Iceland just holding my life skills. Uh, went to Reykjavik like every young uh, Icelandic kid to study further. Uh, I was good at math and sports, so obviously I went into art school. Then I moved to Zurich to um, try on life. It was awesome. Small startup, a lot of beer. Moved to Copenhagen 15 years ago. Went to uh, Dallas Design School for a master's because I just had a kid that I can slack a little bit. And then I've been working at the, the same company actually for 12 years. <laughs> so let's leave it at that. All right. Can we take two each of this? Sure. We have maybe a heritage of being a creative agency, but now it's about solving problems we solve problems for other people all the companies so i think that the world has changed a little bit and definitely our way of thinking in a nutshell right so let's go into our <coughs> today's about management i'm super interested in uh, product design is actually what i normally uh, uh, talk to people about today's about management or leadership or running a team and so on it's a new topic we're a little uh, uh, shaky on that let's see if we deliver but we thought it was due to explain why we got into management and why you got ahead of a team and why do you want to do this thing? Um, and I'm going to go first, then he goes. But for me, um, I spent, uh, I think it was, what, eight years working at my desk. And what I noticed uh, in my experience is that I've always worked in, uh, in agencies or companies, never on the client side. So I don't know how it is on the other side, but I guess it's pretty much similar. There's always some sort of process of convincing somebody to do something. So a, a pitch, pitch, a pitch. Then you establish a budget, so more or less up in the time. When you have a budget, you can scope some activities. Once you scope some activities, you can staff a team. When you have a staff a team, you can book it because you're already staffed. Once it's booked, your boss is gonna sort of come to you with a true version of what the project has been, and then it's gonna arrive to you, right? That's roughly how it works. Yes? No? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's how it goes. And for many, many years, uh, many, many, seven, eight, <laughs> so, so then, that's so many. Um, I really experienced this. <laughs> uh, it has always been like that. And uh, but for those many, many years, I never really cared because I thought, I thought, doesn't matter. I'm gonna be so good that I'm gonna know my stuff so well that it doesn't matter. I'm gonna make this great. And you know, back to the years with uh, with Martin. I worked a lot. I got, you know, was one of these uh, UI dudes, knowing all the latest developments on Sketch, installing plugins, writing articles, getting leaders. Adobe wanted to run out of a small plugin we did back then when uh, uh, all the version control wasn't existing. But, so it was super cool. I was really hyped. I got a job, I think, for that as well because it was cool. I went talking about it. But no matter how good you are, and I'm sorry to break this to you guys. Uh, until you sit this part down, the chances to improve the quality of a project don't increase. Um, so I quickly figured that, uh, you know, I have to <laughs> climb my way up to that goddamn handshake uh, that, that, that establishes a project, right? Back to unperfect uh, dynamics that don't follow the books, what Ernest was saying. Reality is most projects happen as a, we were in school together with that dude. Uh, I know a guy who knows a guy. And project starts like that. We're going to make a website there. And then comes down to something else, and it's too late. So I told myself, I'm going to have to become a manager. So this is what I still do, and this is why I'm still doing it, is chasing the, the good project. Uh, good evening. Um, so yeah, I think that's why I'm a manager. I don't have uh, people uh, uh, goals or running armies. For me, it's really getting to the source and having the chance to scope and set the project in the right way so we can deliver on, on good stuff. 
Um, and if it takes uh, on uh, having dinners and drinking booze with a client and <laughs> making I'll do it. Well, uh, of course. Yeah, it's gotta take that. Uh, yeah, you go. Sure. Completely different story. Maybe <laughs> less interesting or more interesting. I don't know. But uh, being an old man, same company for 12 years, playing the waiting game. <laughs> okay, hey, I'm sorry. <laughs> being the, the good soldier and just waiting in line. Maybe it sounds sad, but it's not because when I started, we were 45, now we're 700. So it's not like I've been at the same company so long. So there's always been a journey. There's always been uh, growing different challenges. So so it was really a kind of a matter of, uh, yeah, please. Thinking for oneself, do I have some some personal ambitions of, of conquering the world, or, or am I actually a part of something that is really really great? And sure, over uh, you know periods of time, I thought maybe I should see the scenery, but also this is a great place to work. So basically, when the call came, I thought, yeah, this I have to do because this is definitely the next challenge. This is uh, obviously a great opportunity. So for me, it was maybe not the uh, aspiration necessarily to become a manager, but for, it was a really natural opportunity when it arose like three, three years ago. It would be cool to hear what you think, what is your motivation at some point, uh, or just reflect about it, because it's actually, we have to look a little back. Uh, why did I have that? Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, you're on. Um, the world has changed so much. Once upon a time, yeah, that's that's that's. that's uh, <laughs> and and I think you know we all all been working in a creative industry, or at least a lot of us. Have, but I think um, this quote this quote actually sums it up a little bit, because we are not. A, uh, what do you call it? Interesting. We're not the same. <laughs> we, it's not about our own ego. We are not satisfying our own creative ambitions. We are solving problems for somebody else. It's somebody else's product. So we have to take our ego out of the equation. And that being said, being having working in product development, uh, things have been become so complicated. We're not doing a poster with an ad. <clears throat> Maybe you never did, but. The age of the unicorns has kind of come to an end. We have uh, people that kind of do it all. They do the graphic, they could do the coding, launch it, and you know, one man army. Today, it takes an army, it takes a village to launch a product. It takes a lot of UX designers, a lot of visual designers, it takes a lot of developers, product managers. So it's not this uh, one man band anymore. And three years ago, two years ago, actually, Almost three. <laughs> Almost three. We were eight designers, big company, successful company, great heritage, smaller team, two nationalities. But it just has taken off when the world has changed. Our focus has changed in what we're working with. So today we have almost 20 designers. The last one is getting in. We have 10 nationalities, which I think is uh, so awesome because it brings diversity, it brings uh, different perspectives. Our uh, kind of uh, protected Scandinavian bubble is, is beautiful, but maybe it needs a little bit of perspective sometimes. It's like the, the immigration office when you arrive at the New York airport, it's like everybody is shouting. <laughs> it's like that. It's nice. <laughs> so we, I mean, we have a, have a huge team and it's uh, such a joy to have, uh, have this uh, have an opportunity to to help people grow and, and you know try to <coughs> scale in a in a natural way in a and it's you know where it has to go fast it can be difficult but we're alive we're alive still <laughs> oh. do you know those, this uh, movie it's my, one of my favorite <coughs> but I think we have a big group and it's the two of us and what makes it work is actually we have a, a young guy that is willing to try out stuff, can see the potential in, in actually doing things differently. Maybe doesn't know all the background of the company, you know, I'm the company man, 
so he can run up front, uh, up front and find the new ways and be explorative and I can be the old guy just making sure that people <laughs> kind of get to where they need to go. <laughs> yeah, right. So we <laughs> yeah, so the, the other presentation is now we have this in headlines. How we got there, right? That's a uh, Let's look back in the, um, you know, now it's almost three years that accumulate to get to this point. Wanted to break it down into uh, things we've learned along the way. We're going to break it in the three parts. So designing the people part, designing processes and ceremonies, and also designing our reputation as a design team within a company. So let's cross the weird stuff out. You know, it's not about teams, about people. We'll know that you can read it in any business uh, review, uh, business review article. But I wanted to level a little bit into uh, something I experienced when I started uh, managing, both here at uh, Merkle, but also the experience that was before. This very moment, day one, when you're a new uh, manager, it, it, it's, a, it's a storm of feelings coming together. Because uh, if you look at it from your point of view, you knew that the uh, 1st of January you'd have become the new boss of that team. You'd have probably known that for a few months. Your head is everywhere. You read all the articles. You're super pumped. You've learned so much from the past. You're ready to go. Your team instead is like having 3rd of January, first day of the year. Like they told them one month ago that the old boss is going, and now there's a new dude coming. So in, it, like immediately there is this, what I learned at least, uh, <laughs> this giant clash of energy that, that goes on, right? If I have to summarize it, it almost goes like, you know, coming with all these new ideas, and you mature along the way, but turns out your ideas are not theirs. They don't necessarily match. Actually, they can't be match. Um, what do you think design is and all this, uh, you know, product and feedback? And, and turns out it's not necessarily theirs. It may be there for a long time and they don't think that uh, that's how you do it. <laughs> it's not. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> this is going to be the team of your dreams. Nah, it's not going to be your team of your dreams. It's going to be a normal team. You're going to have good things, bad things. You're going to have a chance to, to, to move it, to mold it, but it's not about you and your projection on them. Um, yeah, this is the way it should work. This is the way it should work. Definitely might not be their favorite way of working. Now, for all of you are mature, self-controlled, don't take things personal, and uh, super advanced in uh, life uh, at Zen. This might sound completely all right to you, but for uh, uh, excited about design and uh, product design, uh, 30 years old Italian dude who lived in Denmark, <laughs> this was a giant uh, smack in the face. Uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, processing there, like, what? <laughs> I'm so excited about all of this, I can't wait to do things and conquer things together and then having to chill let's relearn everything right so obviously things i couldn't do or things that we can do is can't fire them all and rehire new motivated people can't get rid of them this is a serious point a good manager we agreed has to be able to work with the team you inherit there's going to be new hires so you gotta have a plan in place on how to deal with the ones that have been there can't force them to listen and they will follow. You can repeat it, you can say it. I can't give guarantee on, on the follow thing. Um, and as a matter of fact, you can't force any type of uh, program initiatives, activities. It's like throwing uh, the spaghetti on the wall. Some will stick, some will fall, right? Oh, <laughs> Italian. <laughs> Googie always says uh, the best way to lead people is to walk behind them. Yeah. Like the, I, I can't remember when I said it, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I heard her saying, yeah. uh, like the, the, the old dude and the babe, and then, yeah. Okay. Yeah. no, but seriously, um, I think in, in, in the journey of, of, of uh, running the team, I learned this, uh, I, I joined that I had some very strict views on what I thought design was, uh, of how we should uh, keep our Figma files, or how we should do and uh, this, and now we should do that. Uh, and I call that some sort of design maturity, and I would I would measure everyone based on that field. Are they on my band or they're not? If they're on my band, they're cool, they're worthy, they're, they're, they're talented. If they're not, ah, man, they're a drug. And I actually learned that 
you know, there's actually when <laughs> when I hear the, when I hear designers bitching about the general level of the company of the others, the first thing instead of buying into, oh yeah, you're so right. That I'm always like, has he got enough stomach? Has he got enough uh, knowledge to to actually realize that? We're all in different timelines. It's not that the company is bad, it's just we're a group of people. We're, we're, we have life problems, we are all at different stages in, in our design maturity. Um, so this design system topic, right? That now we have to forget right on everything we work with. So if I'm here and I'm talking with somebody who just started keeping their keeping their toes mm -hmm. into this uh, in this world, I'm gonna probably talk to them just softly about system thinking trying to move the first step there together. And if it's going to take three projects for them to do it, fine. It's going to take two projects, but then we can move to the next one. If I'm talking to a more experienced dude, then I'm not going to talk about that stuff. I want to be talking about something that he can chew and he can work. So again, it's not really about design. It's about you dealing with humans, I think. Like having empathy is crucial in running the team. And I'm sorry if this is obvious again for some of you, but for us, <laughs> Discover it. Oh fuck! I have to have empathy. Um, <laughs> but let's go back into design maturity. Um, what is design maturity, or just uh, maturity? Depends, right? As we said, it's not really a designist only thing. It could apply to anything. And we thought about making a quiz. Um, so option number one of what design maturity is: stick up your hands. When I say so. Uh, so first one is how skilled you are. The more skilled you are, the more your design maturity. Uh, option two, how much people trust you? How much you are a go-to person to trust you? Question number three, as a point number three, how many years of experience you have? When are you mature design-wide? Who's for one? Great. Who's for Hang on. Are you a late uh, bloomer? Okay. You're number <laughs> one. Yes. Who's for number two? Oh, and also number three, all the rest, I guess. What about all three? Mm -hmm. yeah. Fair. yeah, fair. It's a trick question. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Um, well, maybe not. We respectfully uh, hear all of your answers, but we, we actually believe that number two is the correct one. Um, at least for us, for us, in our context. Uh, because, um, because I'm going to explain to you why. So to, to, to explain this, we always use, uh, we, we made a model. This is the first time I'm explaining yeah. it to people. So it's actually very, we made this model, right? We have designers, so we thought triangles work. We love triangles. <laughs> so at, at, now uh, what I want you to do is follow us in this. So on one side of the triangle, yeah, okay. we want okay. to place cross. They're gone, I guess. This is what, uh, this is what many designers think it takes to be a super cool designer. In that bucket goes knowing everything about Figma, everything about code, everything about uh, motion uh, tools, everything about all that. In the other corner goes team. How nice are you with your team? How nice are you with your project team? How nice are you with your whole company? And then the other bucket goes the client. You know. Uh, how nice the, are you with the, the client? I believe you. And that's because of this we've introduced the triangle of trust. Triangle of trust. <laughs> uh, what does that mean? Uh, let, let, let's let's bring an example on the, on dealing with your with your current team, right? So you have you have different people, you have different levels of maturity. But what we really love about the triangle of trust is that anyone could be positioned on it. And uh, what we really also know is that we don't really care if you have a score of 100 uh, in craft, but maybe you have, you are too little on, on client and on, on team. That doesn't mean you're a great designer. That means you're a great tool, dude. Um, and for us, we can't make a one measure, the only one to weight all of our team. We need to have a way to, to see the good in each one of our team members and leverage it. I hope this makes sense. I feel like I'm blowing a lot like that. Um, so, for example, let's make an example of dealing with seniors, right? So, this senior here, our triangle of trust tells us uh, that you know the client likes him, 
because it's very nice. And when you when you hear it from account manager and so on, they hear, yeah, client loves him. He wants him in all the meetings. He wants to join the workshops. But what does that mean? It means that that person is good at selling solutions, good at finding possibilities for the client and being able to deliver uh, solutions in a believable way and being accountable. As far as we care, I would stretch it to as long as the client wants it, then he could deliver a cross sounds in the morning. I don't mind. If the client trusts him, I'm engaged. The client pays our salary at the end of the day. So it's it's important that it has a skill there. The team loves him. He's, a, he's reliable, is uh, a go-to guy, always has a smile, yes, hat, all that good stuff. And yes, he doesn't know a lot about Figma because uh, he missed that train. And, uh, and he knows he uses it a bit rough and inspires that shit, but are you pointing at me? <laughs> pointing at half of my team. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, the point here is, is it an issue? Do we see it as an issue? No, we don't. Because uh, I, I see no alarm being rang uh, from, from a business perspective. Uh, should I do a lot of work with this person? Uh, well, I mean, not necessarily because he's bringing the vacant home, but if I want, then I know that where I could challenge him or where I could get more out. So I want you to take roughly five seconds and think, how is my stats? What kind of designer am I? So I have to, to map myself out. Where are, it's like a video game, right? Where are your strengths? What are your less strengths? It's very important, very nice tool to self-evaluate a little. What, what would you see yourself? Five. Yes. So why we really love this? First, we made it, so we love it. Uh, but second, uh, anyone can be positioned. Anyone. I challenge you to not position this, uh, not anyone that doesn't fit it. Um, it's not about tools or, uh, or skills. We have to battle this a lot. We inherited a team where they thought that if you could use principles like a pro, you were a great designer. Yeah, you couldn't talk to a client. That's not a great designer. That's a great prototype. It's, um, it's not about years of experience. I was 31 and I had people 10 years older than me. What am I giving them? Life advice and career suggestions? I'm nobody to do that. So we were looking for a tool where we could bring the conversation in a discussion setup where there's no age or differences of that kind that could affect the conversation. It's all about how you're working with your team, how's it going with learning <laughs> tools, and uh, how is it going with the client. So I shall recap, how do we run our team? Well, you could be in agreement with us or not. I don't mind. Uh, uh, but what we think is if you deliver on trust, if the environment, the client, the team trust you, you're good. You're gonna go a long way for us. We believe we believe in you, we support you. And we're not necessarily gonna put you on top of the priority list. When you have 20 people, you're gonna you got stuff from somebody. You can't pick all of them together, we're only two. But if we want to work with that person, then we use the triangle to figure out where to pull the conversation. And obviously, if you're still learning how to deliver on the trust, that's where we start working more together, right? So if you you just started, of course, you have to fill you have to fill your your uh, your scheme. Now, last three things, and I'm going to give you the mic back. Mm -hmm. And I promise we are past the half, so we're almost there. Uh, yeah. So how do we go from two, right? Grow meaning means change. Change hurts. Uh, we said it. You have to change the way you've done something, it hurts. Uh, if, if I can't solve that, uh, go to the gym, you wanna become jacked, you gotta train every day a little bit, and eventually you're gonna be jacked. Uh, I hope, <laughs> I don't know, but that's how it goes, right? And it's not only a gym thing, it's a, it's a sport thing. And I really love this, this was a meme or something I saw on, on LinkedIn, where it says that if you put in an act, time and effort, uh, this is how you go at change. Uh, and this means that every day, but you can expand the paradigm to every project or every quarter or every year, do something differently from how you, you always done it. 
until it becomes a new habit. But on the long run, you're going to have covered much more ground than, uh, uh, than before. As opposed to, for example, pick up on a designer because it's not doing something right. And force them in too much, you're going to get a very high effort response from a designer in a maybe week or two weeks, span, a month, span, time. It's going to perform, but it's unhuman to keep a level which is so foreign to your standard for so long. So there's going to be a drop. And then you're going to start this whipping routine until you destroy the person. There's no way. I, I'm constantly working outside my comfort zone. So, yeah, it's lower. You know, when I was living in Africa, in my village, my shaman once told me, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think that's kind of a journey together. He was also your shaman. <laughs> <laughs> Last thing, football analogies, why not? Uh, I love it. When I heard this, it was so spot on and it, it made me reflect a lot in terms of how we should do training uh, being prepared or implement these changes you think about football the teams like mine that doesn't play champions league uh, i think else we only have one game a week on sunday sunday is what the whole team has to perform from monday until saturday not as people sit there and wait they train every day boom they put in the the miles and the kicks and all that so explain me why, if for a designer, this is a presentation or a pitch or, a, or a, uh, any sort of moment of touch with, with clients or stakeholders, why in the between we should train? How much time? We've been talking a lot about this, what we want to do with our team, because we ended up that our team was just doing the work. We're just preparing for this, but we weren't training them enough uh, during, during the rest of the time in between. And on that note, so how do we train design? Um, it's a little bit of a difficult question because you know we're doing it all day, just doing the work, putting in the hours. So hopefully, gradually, also getting better. When we have a when you have a deep pool of talent in all kinds of evolutionary states, uh, it can also be hard to fit the right content to the right person because somebody might be awesome at prototyping, don't be coaching on prototyping. Maybe that person needs coaching on, on delivering pitches or on presenting. So we always have to kind of think of uh, trying to tailor program to individuals. And, and it's, I mean, same on, on any level. It's about learning, it's about consolidating your knowledge and then putting it in, in action. And it doesn't matter if you are a veteran of uh, 20 years or 30 years in the business or if you're a newcomer, it's, it's the same recipe. And I don't think there is any crystal ball, there is no magical recipe. Uh, we tried a lot of stuff, we listen to our people, we try to respond, we try again, sometimes we fail, sometimes not. One thing that is really important, this is not common invention, I mean, this is a common practice, but just to keep uh, very tight one-on-one -on -one with everyone, we do it once a month, we get our senior people actually to help out, we have a huge team, so our team leads, they, they help out on it. It's just about well-being, are you okay, giving some uh, professional sparring as well. But then we do some what we call design power-ups because we want to evolve those uh, Pokemons. And just an example, I mean, we, we dive into all kinds of uh, topics. It could be CRM, or it could be presentation tech, so whatever. But one example is that we've invested quite heavily in, in prototype because, yes, it's a craft skill, but it's just so valuable when we are selling to uh, clients a solution that they can can understand it visually. It's so valuable when we're delivering to developers, and it's such a great tool just to try stuff. But we had a situation where we had maybe two or three persons in, in the team that were prototyping. Every time we would see an awesome website on the on the internet, and people would like, how do they do this? This is awesome. And you know, how do we solve it? How do we pitch if we don't have it? Always the same people coming in doing the like work for, for presentations. We invested time in it. We broke into smaller groups to make it more manageable. Uh, every Friday. Every Friday for, I think, five weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, it requires time, for sure. But now we're at a place where I think almost every person in the team, maybe me excluded, but apart from that, 
can actually deliver really decent quality prototypes on apps or websites or whatever. And, and again, it's great for delivery. It's great for presentations. And now we don't have to panic about who's available, who can, who can, program, yeah. who can animate. It's my like project say, oh, we need a design can prototype. It can't even work. It just feels so good. Yeah. And, and, and that's about basically just raising the baseline. Yes, we are all working on our craft. We're all working on our team skills or client skills. But we also need to move our skills. A few years back, it was about Photoshop. I don't think our people can do Photoshop. Maybe I'm the only one. Again, huge team. What does that mean? We have no idea what the person next to me is doing on a daily basis. Uh, so we arranged uh, a weekly show and help. Um, Thank you. We came up with a logo that's pretty unique. Thank you. Representing uh, lunch because we do it around lunch time. But it's just two people having 10 minutes presentation. Not about pitching, but I'm just working on this problem, maybe explaining the context, maybe getting some feedback, maybe get some insight. Just being collectively looking at each other's stuff. And that becomes more and more difficult with scale. It's no problem when you have three designers, five designers. But 20 designers meeting in a room looking at each other's stuff is more challenging. Uh, we have a rhythm in our agenda. We try to meet everyone, or we have them one, once a month, we have those to show and tell every week. We meet the whole team talking about professional stuff. And then we have our power ups. Then we talk a lot. So, about hiring, because we need to scale, we need, need more people. How do we? It's a magic formula. Okay, I'd like to try point of this. Have you seen it before? <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of I've seen and I experienced uh, how, how do we hire designers? It's actually kind of we are privileged in a way that we actually have something that we can show people. I mean, my wife sent out a CV, who reads a CV. So we have, there's a craft dimension in it, obviously. But I've seen people being put to tests, you know, here's a, here's a project, solve it and come back. And if you solve it, maybe you get a job. We actually try to approach it, I mean, your portfolio, your craft is what gets you the interview. That's kind of okay. Your your craft is set. That's a given. That's a baseline. That's why you're here. So in the interview, we are kind of trying to gauge those axes. How would this person be in front of a client? How would this person be in a team? Is it is it the right match? And I'm sorry to say, I mean, there is no magic formula. This, this is just pure alchemy. Sometimes it crashes. It's dark magic. Um, we had failures. We had. Plenty of success, you uh, often argue, uh, but there is no magic formula. But just trying to trust your instinct, listen to your stomach, and that you have to go with it and hire or not hire. Something like that. Yeah. All right. Let's. We are. Let's, shall we cut it here, Martin? Or okay. Cool. Right. The last part is. I'm gonna speed up. So, uh, the last part is design reputation. So we talked about the team members. So that's the core of your team. And we talked about the team in itself, how to uh, train it, how to nurture it. Now we'd like to talk about the team within an organization. We are a design team within a big organization. So let's talk about, I think to frame that, it's about talking uh, the design industry. Wow, that was a long Thank you. Uh, so the uh, design industry, where we work, as we see, it splits in two types of businesses. At least the the, the agency side, we could say. Uh, we, we we say <laughs> there's businesses about design, and then there is design businesses. I know it's a bit like well, uh, up to interpretation, but I'm gonna I'm gonna explain to you. A business about design is a company that uh, sees in design and design-related practices a way to make business. I sell you two hours of UX and five hours of design, and we're going to build a website, in short. Yes, it's often uh, run by uh, corporate dudes who study CDIs and certain opportunity monetizing on uh, design practices you'll experience, because that's the gig of digital in the last 20 years. 
Then you got designed businesses. Designed businesses are your boutiques, design led boutiques doing exclusive work, uh, really nice. Uh, they could design it almost uh, indirectly, they put a design process from choosing the, the, the cover of your toilet seat in the bathroom to to the whole office design and like a food design everywhere. And of course, we love that. That's, you know, I owe. Now the trick is, that's what I had to learn growing up, that in the business about design, it is a bit more mercenary. It's a bit more soulless. It's a bit more evil in some way. We make the big bucks. Whereas in the design uh, businesses where you make the, the posters and the identities for museums and cinemas, you really express yourself, but you don't make a penny. And now I'm a designer by trade. I'm not a fool by trade. I want to make as many money as a lawyer, but I don't want to become a lawyer. I want to become a designer that makes money like a lawyer. So for me, when I grew up and I had to make this choice, it was very obvious that I'm going to definitely sit in here, but I'm not going to forget who I am. And I'm not going to forget what, what my heart beats for, what I studied for, what, what my vocation is. And you're the same, right? Really? Yeah. Um, so, how do you... No, no. Sorry. Yeah, okay. No, the, the point here is... <laughs> the point here is that what we're, what we're trying to do at Merkel is a little bit that. You know, that's not lying to each other. We're definitely a business about design. Uh, we are a corp, you know, we're global, we're powerful and all that. But what we want to do with our team is actually this. Now, and now, <laughs> you can say, <laughs> no, but it, it is a mindset. And, and, and uh, yeah, another of Mike, Mike's is, uh, quotes, everyone who's actually touching the product or the project in any way is a part of the design process. So it's not about having a project manager just sitting and project managing. Everyone who's touching it is is a is a designer. And when we are in a big corporation like Merkle, even though our uh, king of kings wants to be, we are a creative office and all. But when we are scaling so fast, we have we risk of becoming the the small weird kids in the in the in the basement somewhere. So therefore, it's so important to kind of instill this uh, mindset of it's not about us the creatives we are part of a creative company whether it's an uh, it or a developer or a project manager or a uxer we are trying to instill a creative atmosphere we are building a creative place to work but it's up on us to actually carry that flag and be a little bit loud and make sure that actually people around us feel that they are part of a creative environment and this is a really hard thing and you know we are constantly trying to to push it and i think it's going fine but it's how do we do this it's about being the first ones to actually post some inspiration on the internet it's about making our office look nice which we haven't actually succeeded in but constantly trying to be a little bit loud being the ones who people want to hang out with or being the entertainers at the client meetings everything counts everything counts yeah uh, we have one last good night story uh, for you about this topic of scaling design as a religion within an organization that forgot what design was. Uh, I brought you, uh, uh, I brought you my first uh, experience there. Um, I was thirty. Uh, I landed this head of design job. And I'm not going to mention names because I don't want to point fingers at all. Uh, but that's my experience. Uh, so I'm going to try to talk about it very mildly the way it was. I've been hired specifically with this mandate, which fascinated me a lot. We're like, we lost a bit our way. We want to reboot our design culture. And I couldn't wait for that. And I had a small team, we were only five. Um, but I accepted it. I was young and I never done any of it. So I was like, fair enough. It, it, it sounds logical. And I remember three months in, I, I'm not joking you, three months in, I was going in every day, every meeting, every general meeting, every management meeting, every sub work meeting. I could not hear the word design ever. The only time I would hear it was when they were saying service design. Like, they, 
what happened, I don't know what happened, I have an opinion, but it doesn't matter. Um, they forgot a lot about what it was, um, what it means. The, you know, the, the little house <laughs> that I just showed, what does that entail? They were all talking about these words and they never came up three months in. I remember being like, whoa, damn. It sounds like, hmm, how the heck do I bring this design word into this mix? And I remember I was uh, flipping cards and like, should I, you know, should we brand a great website? Should I make uh, some, you know, to be very good at my job, then they're going to love it. But I don't, I didn't think that it was strong enough. It's a website you visited once, it's never going to look as good as you design it. So uh, that, that's just not going to cut it. And then one day, uh, it was spring. I've been invited to this workshop with one of our clients, and we hosted this workshop in this room we had, which was a storage room for our desks. Uh, but UXers loved it because you had empty walls, so they could run workshops in them. They could hang things on the wall. And I, oh, I got participated in my workshop. And I took photos, and I could just couldn't believe my eyes that we were having clients paying sizable amount of money, brainstorming creative solutions, whether it's UX or design, into that space. I was like, okay, here I found, I found something that hurts. This hurt a lot, there's opportunity. Now, at the same time, my boss, it was, because it was uh, spring-ish, told me, you know, you need to start thinking where you want to spend your educational budget uh, for the year. Designers are going to start coming, asking for conferences and so on. I thought, how much is the budget? Like, it's about 8K. Like, <laughs> okay, yeah. that's a lot of money. Uh, so I thought, okay, so we're eight and five people, that's oh, 40,000 okay. Danish Corona all together. I thought, okay, I got all this cash, how can I use it? And then I was like, let me think about my background, my upbringing, right? I have a Catholic upbringing, I'm Italian. And I noticed one thing. <laughs> The church always sits in the best spot of every town. Have you ever noticed that? I don't know your level of religion is, uh, and I don't want to get into that thing. But if you pay attention, at least in, in Italy, but also Iceland, I pay this homage to Iceland. I've actually been here as well, but I didn't take this photo. The church always sits in the best spot. The church is the place of reference. So I had this idea, and I went to my team. I remember we had a team meeting, and I said, okay, guys, listen. These were designers that were there before. And normally they would blast their educational budget weekend in Berlin, see your uh, uh, fancy uh, designer speaking about typography, showing a bunch of posters, having a date about the amount of the work is doing, drink the spirits, come back, spend your life uh, the rest of the year a bit frustrated because still have to do the day to day. Or we could use that cash to build our own place. And guess what they think? So, we went to my uh, CEO, we pitched this whole thing, how much we needed to feed our creativity. We wanted a space that uh, had uh, facilities and it was bringing us away from the screen and hands-on projects. We created some guidelines. We even made some mock-ups of the space, all rough and ready in keynote, just throwing things, uh, what we would need, how we would need it. Uh, yeah, you can see some of the pitch. At this stage, the CEO stops and is like, I just don't get why you want to use the educational budget for this. And I'm like, I don't know. And then uh, he gave me the money, and then he left my educational budget for it. So we actually went to New York and had a blast there as well. <laughs> and then when we came back, we started building the space. Obviously, we had to stay extra time. It was a summer work of work. Nobody was an office hour. This was a uh, passion and blood. Uh, and we bought things on DBA, you know, nothing fancy, but uh, we came together, we did it as a, as a team. Everybody from the office chipped in and space looked amazing, uh, as it, in comparison to how it was before, right? It didn't take a big effort, you might say, but uh, what is important here is that from, the, the first, from that day onwards, the first place everyone would bring a guest in the office would be this one. And this is what our design team did, right? First thing that we did. Not, oh, and we do user research and uh, uh, like we had an angle. And I finally managed to put the word design in the mouth 
and it's still there. So thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much, guys. Very interesting. So it hits us here, right? But this just uh, has some questions for sure. Right? Sorry for uh, running so long. But uh, yeah, uh, that's how I, we, we had hoped that actually we could have both <laughs> talk before pizza. You saved me because I'm going to talk for a long time. Yeah, so <laughs> we're, we're gonna lock the doors, right? You're not gonna get out of it until you hear the next talk. That's how it is. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Same thing. And we're filming you as well. Crazy experience. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, any questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you say a uh, client a lot, and not everyone has, you know, is a design consultancy. So try to find clients facing users or something like that. In what company? In the triangle of uh, trust, you don't have client, yeah. team, yeah. Yeah. Client, but the uh, we don't have clients yet. Or no, we don't. We have the product. We're selling the product as a subscription. Uh, yeah. Users don't have clients. Like yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. We don't put the science product like fine to it. No, but you have to sell some idea to someone at some point. I, I guess it's a stakeholder. Stakeholder. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. always somebody that controls the money, that controls in exchange of your work. <laughs> I have a question though. Like, yeah. I think it's, it's a luxury, you know, to uh, do a solution and then you know. You're also the next project, right? So you don't have to necessarily, not always, maybe sometimes, you not always have to think about the longevity of the product that you're signing, right? So that means then the, the client is the most important thing. Uh, because once you're done, it's on to the next one. But what about like internal projects, like, like design systems, where you have to, or do you have to think about that in a different way? We, like, we, we don't treat any client on this. Let's use it and toss it. Uh, if anything, we, we do a lot of work to set these long-term visions, and uh, we, I think it's more like they, I think it's the new, but they double down on making sure that goes long-term. There's always a long-term gain to it. Um, almost too much. I would say we spend much more time on reminding the... How, how would you go about it if it's an internal project? Like a design do system. Do you have a design system that you reuse from uh, client to client? No, we because it's so custom to what the client needs. So okay. some clients have some very rudimental setups, some clients have more advanced. Okay. So based on that, we scale up and down. Okay. We have okay. huge okay. clients that have no idea what a design system is. Yeah. We have small item clients that only want the design system. Yeah. So I think that's one of the things that has changed so much in the yeah. last two years. Yeah. What, what, what yeah. I, I, I saw two days ago the one Volvo has. They share it with us. I almost wanted to ask them, why do you need us? <laughs> it's perfect. Do you see any cases where they would you know, change the priority of the triangle? Can you imagine a case where you think about it differently? No, because the triangle goes into big, the full sum of it. Yeah. So it's not an exact sum, right? but, but for us, as long as the total of the three makes it to the cut, then we don't care if you have I mean, people can't, but you know, if you have 200, zero, zero, potentially, uh, you have enough trust, most likely, because everybody, if you have it on client, nobody's going to touch you, because they're super loud by the client. I'm curious to hear if uh, you sometimes, either through through your client or directly, if, if you get any feedback or if you have any other kinds of interactions with the clients of your clients. So say the person who sue is your client, but the zoo will have visitors that experience what you're essentially building for zoo as your client. Mm -hmm. So is, is there a feedback loop there? And do you work with your clients on a recurring basis? So you build something for them and launch it, then they come back a, an amount of time later and want to repeat that work or iterate on it where that kind of feedback comes in. Is, is that something that you experience? That's definitely something that we try. And, and as I said before, we have so many clients that have a very long standing relationship because mm -hmm. the solutions we build are complicated and then they have to be maintained, they have to be polished, they have to be reinvented. Re -invented. But it's so often up to the client how much user uh, interviews or, or analysis they want to do. Mm -hmm. So, luckily, I'm really, really into it and I, I, we applaud it. 
we like, I mean, that's just the most valuable insight. But we also have clients that we don't have. It's too expensive, too time consuming, and then fine, I mean, that's, that's your money, but we would highly encourage it. But we have such a wide variety of clients that it's uh, sometimes it's difficult because it's very, very nerdy B2B, some niche business. Okay, we don't have competent people to test it on. Yes, of course you can find it, but maybe they don't want to invest in it. So, yes, we encourage it always, but they don't always buy it. I mean, we're setting the scene. You said you wanted to get management, so you have first an like, understanding of the client needs, uh, the, the timeline of the movies, and the yeah. after that's right. Yeah. And then, okay, good job. You saved yourself. But, like, uh, what do you do to, to save your team? <laughs> so, so, so. Great question. I'm definitely carrying the cross. Like, I'm doing it for my team, right? And But do they have, like, personal understanding? Or are they closer to the client now than how you were before? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I bring a lot of the, I feel at least, I'm bringing, I'm like a union, a labor representative when I attend those meetings, right? I always call some bullshit up that they make, and I'm like, we're going more time, or we cannot do that. That's the best I can do to deliver the good project. So I feel I, I'm bringing the pains I've experienced on my skin a lot up to them. And I negotiate at that level. Uh, it's it's the best as in it's mm. what you have to do. Um, yeah, uh, have ends meet somehow. Yeah, and, uh, that's a compromise you you're facing. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think that the catch with it of climbing the the ladder and that I didn't consider when I made that decision is that I had to manage people, and that that has nothing to do with design. But not at all. I had to go back to this, this you know, Brad Frost, the atomic design dude. Uh, the design process is weird and complicated because it involves people who are weird and complicated. He says that. So right. I, I, that just makes sense. Matt? Yeah, I actually have a question around the music also the that time. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> How do you use it actually? Yes, because you had an example of a senior, you had a junior, and I can't remember the last mm -hmm. one, but then it's also talks a little bit into a career that kind of approach, like mm -hmm. a rating role. Mm -hmm. How do you have where you split up between people management and uh, and actually crafting so your goal as an individual crafting them? I think you always have to craft a very individual plan to each and every one because I mean you can't make them into us because they're all individuals. So when we, I think we have them in our, in our uh, either it's one on one sort of some, some uh, career interviews that we often have. And we're just honest about how's it going, what are your ambitions, what do you think you can bring to the table, I don't think that we have to work on. And it's obvious, I mean, when, when managing people that are older than, than we are, I mean, it's not about life lessons, but maybe that person could be stronger in selling and being a partner to the, to the project management or, or account people. And I think that's a part, big part of our job of being a designer is being able to sell and help finding projects. But on the other hand, it's also, you know, looking after a team. Yeah, yeah when, I think when you go that big of a team, if you're very short, you can try to work on guidelines how to work the same way. When you go so big, you just don't have material time to enforce the way to work. You gotta, you gotta trust and measure on other parameters. So we abandon all of that, and we purely listen to how the person performs. If they deliver and trust, we trust them to to do a good job. And if they don't know something else, that, 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 I think we've got time for one last question, right? And then uh, then this pizza. Yeah, just the new one. Sorry. Yeah, yeah uh, that would be the second one. Like the right. Yeah. 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 So uh, I think it's one one observation I have. That I think it's great that you guys are two team leads that really collaborate with each other because sometimes you're alone, you know, like yeah, yeah. out and and this kind of you can ask your, your boss or whatever, right? It's it's easier for you, I guess, to change views and really be uh, vulnerable and also being uh, secure in a safe space. Best uh, best thing we yeah. can have is um, each other for sure. Yeah. I mean Right. Right. It's, it's, <laughs> no, it, I, yeah, but it is very valuable because we also uh, experience 
because we have a huge uh, UX and how we have to copyright. So actually having those people who are managing those groups, we need to meet and vent and complain or congratulate or, you know, because even though we want to be a part of our team, mm -hmm. we are, there is still some kind of business. It has to be a professional business. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a, it's a sensitive balance with no magic formula. I think there are so many things in your uh, in your talk that's quite interesting and can be used, you know, whether it's a consultancy or product or company or whatever. I think uh, you gave a really, really honest uh, view into both uh, how you manage and your troubles uh, along with your struggles along the way, but also one of the most honest views on how a consultancy is done. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's actually quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for taking the time to prepare. Thank you. That's really, really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. You already said that. But uh, thanks for inviting me, Rihanna and uh, Martin. I was really excited because uh, this is a super interesting topic, and I've talked with you guys before, at least you, Anna, on on all of being practical in terms of doing design and product and how we go about it. Uh, and you already brainstormed the list of interesting topics. I uh, was scratching my head, but they're all pretty good. I was like, how do I double do do down on one of these subjects? But then um, I tried to go in, in a bit of a different direction. So I'm going to give you an introduction as to what I've done in Luna. Yeah. Just it like briefly, what is you know, you're going to touch on that? I'm angry. I also yeah. not just the company, but what kind of uh, setup you have. I will, I will, I will at least uh, voice over that one. <laughs> so uh, I've chosen the title scaling and leading design in hypergrowth. And I think the hypergrowth part is super important for the understanding of this next uh, this slide day in, in so because we've gone through an insane scale up phase. And I came in as a head of design just at the beginning of that phase and just took off. So that has pretty much defined how I run my head of design managerial role, but also how I try to at least lead design into a good direction. And so just super quickly about me, and then I'll also give a pitch about Luna. I hope, hope most of you guys know, at least if you live in Denmark, also in the when it should be good enough now that everyone should know Luna. And then I'm going to put some numbers on the hypergrow. Uh, also, just to give you a sense of, of the insane ride we're on. Then, to be able to do my part in leading design, I had to also mature design a lot. Actually, when I came into Luna, uh, put a little bit on thought mm -hmm. on my profession and how I kind of like instilled that in the company. So it's pretty necessary. And uh, then about leading design, which also in terms of about managing. Uh, this team of designers that also grew pretty rapidly in, in my time as, as head up. And then, how much time we have for it? I don't know, but uh, and, uh, ask me anything or uh, just catch up afterwards. I'll, uh, I'll niggle and hang around. So, uh, just very briefly on me that's me. This is my process designer, Tim, who was uh, employee number two in Luna, super smart and talented uh, designer, uh, product designer. So, the science is, I really love your triangle of trust and understanding. And I actually remind myself very much of the senior design profile. So my design consistencies and craft doesn't necessarily lie in this math or motion design. It's about facilitation and collaboration and getting design to front of this pragmatically beautiful. And I have a master's in motion science, so that's the science between both technology and society, growth technology. Did uh, some startups, uh, also a place called Innovation Lab on innovation and innovation practices. Uh, spent five years at a place in you know, informatics as a consultant. Uh, so it's a design and software consultancy house. So we were also in the business that sells design, or however you put it, uh, on that part. And then I had a brief stint at the marketing bureau in Aarhus before I came to Luma, where I had three different positions. So I came in as head of product design, primarily only my craft as a UX designer. Um, and then I got the, the chance to take on this position as head of design, which I'm primarily going to speak to today in this area. And since June 15, I retreated back into a um, 
in the same position when I make the Duma draft. So I will no longer be a mentee. I need to go back and do the sign work again after this insane hybrid release. So just uh, briefly on Duma, we are uh, Intech. Uh, we are one of the, the very few Intechs who has a banking license. Which means that we can operate in the Nordics and do so. So we are in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. Um, founded in 2015, uh, has some really awesome founders who have done an amazing job at selling what Luna is, um, which also means that the guy has a ton of funding, which has kept us afloat until now, seven years in. Uh, also, also named top on the whole Oslo, where we have offices and we've just uh, surpassed the half a million users. Uh, across the noise. We also do business and uh, those exclude the 16,000 businesses we have on board. And yeah, we're pretty proud of our numbers, both in App Stores and on Trust Pilot and everywhere else. And we're doing that pretty fine job. And design is pulling a lot of the weight on the so That's nice. But I didn't have to go quite through the same struggles that you had with the, with the corporate mm -hmm. space and that's in showing also the design and getting the great space because we have the most amazing offices and it's, it's all now so we, we do a lot in that area so um, that's super nice and it also shows you that you have a company who is super interested and into like the creative space and how things look and how they should feel and how we should be part of something that's visually pleasing and delightful but also uh, that we have that, that is brought into our sound. So hypergrowth, scaling really, 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 really fast. Um, so when I started in Luna, we were approximately 80 employees, and three years in now, we're 650 employees. So that's a plus 700% growth rate. And much of that growth rate was within a year and a half, and not before the years. So pretty, pretty insane. Um, and in the beginning, in 2019, when I started, in 2019, almost exactly three years ago, we were like a typical startup, cross collaboration, working in squads. Everybody knew everybody. We kind of like at this fast paced execution, adaptable. We come with an idea we can run with, and that thing is pretty fine. We try to stick with that a lot, but I will say that this this happens when you grow as fast as we do. A lot of new People and all of new roles are introduced, and all of those people and roles need to be defined, understand this company, understand everybody else. So it kind of puts us a slowdown a bit on how our ability to at least execute. And we also got a banking license. So we beforehand we were partnering up with Ucredit, the Danish Incumbent Bank. So we do all the bank business through them. But having a banking license also requires a lot of you in terms of uh, anti money laundering, anti crime prevention, and all of those uh, things that we needed to double and triple down on to be able to keep our license and, and do good banking business. On board, almost 50 people every month. It was crazy. We had town hall every Friday, and there was just slide on slide on slide with new things coming up. And yeah, that was pretty crazy. Specifically, when you're in my position and you want to know everybody because that's part of your way of doing impact and ensuring that they know what the sign is. But I'll get back to that. So this was uh, me coming into 2021. So head of product design, which actually I didn't get much. I was just a UX designer doing my best to keep up and, and introduce a lot of practices into Luna. Um, but I got the chance, uh, my former uh, CPO, a really, really great and visionary guy, uh, Joachim, Unfortunately, they had to go back to essentially his family business. Um, and we were kind of left without anyone to like manage the team and, and all the different work we did and so on. I'm a, I'm a super structured guy. I love structure, form, everything that get my hands up to try and understand and do things down. Uh, I will show in my presentation there. But uh, I inherited this uh, really nice team of me. Now I still have to sign two product designers. Uh, one of them seen before, before, and the other one uh, is a princess who has now come through as a as a full time product designer, and then uh, uh, UXer who were an intern just moving into this really sort of very cool. And um, and this is what looked like a year later. So I was able to hire 
a lot of really skilled and wonderful people who are super lucky about that. Um, and because we were in this insane growth phase, there weren't that much of a limit on how many you could hire, but you just need to follow pace and you need to ensure that you have the capacity to do your design work and, and support the business in their design needs. So I quickly ensured that we at least got a lot more UX designers on board. And, and I just had an interesting chat in the kitchen about roles. What does it mean to be a UX? What does it mean to be a product designer? So, um, but I kind of kept my understanding of the relationship between designer from my previous job positions. And um, so I needed to get a lot of the people who had like, the same mindset that I had and the same kind of toolkit to not only design stuff, but also practice design. So broaden it out into the company, facilitate, ensuring that everybody's on the same page. And um, UX writers, super important, uh, really had a chance to hire three of those from nothing. So suddenly we had really very skilled people doing good better works better. Um, so that was that was very nice. And then uh, about a year ago, I was about to hire a, a full-time UX researcher, really just looking into behavioral research, like the problem space, not, not targeting a specific need, but we're just trying to understand how people interact with money and how they feel for that. That was great. And um, we went from this very small company Again, very design knowledge. We had a lot of miscellaneous stuff. We did everything that related to anything visual, but we needed to distribute ourselves uh, as we grew to maintain impact and, and be part of all the different uh, processes and operations going on across the Yeah, so that was uh, scaling in, in a year and a year and a half. Like, uh, that was that was kind of insane to be part of, but. But I did know when I went into Luna, and um, because when you look at Luna, and, uh, all of you who knows Luna, it looks very visual, a lot of branding, like, it looks nice. And that also mattered a lot to people when I came in. Um, but still, I had to do what I always have to do anywhere, whether I'm in a consultancy, I'm starting a new position, I always have to like get the buy in and explain what does UX about, what does design mean to me, what it isn't just about. Uh, like the final touches and something is actually defining the product and, and utilizing the full toolkit of the design to, uh, to help everybody else to see in, uh, in their craft and in their opportunity. Um, and I've used this a lot. So what I'm trying to do at least with my presentation for all of you guys and girls today is to give you a lot of takeaways. So I'll be pointing to a lot of uh, materials I do, a lot of tools, services I use to get along. And, and everything in between. So hopefully you will be with a lot of takeaways that we might go here. I would recommend this little fine report. It's very visual and it it helped me at least because I used it directly in my first speech to the company about design and the return on investment on it. And it just says basically just put design is dollars, right? Um, and the company still forgets to talk to the users. Damn, Luna didn't talk to it at all. Like no research. Like no validation. It was all drugs and things needed to look really mm -hmm. good. Like the whole aesthetics part of it was super nice. And, and they did they hit the target right because it was a good product, not like it was used usually. But we didn't at all validate and a lot of the issues that we found following where maybe we could improve doesn't make it about understanding who to do the product for and and again and again, design is a thing you build throughout the company. It's not a decentralized units which you request jobs and tasks from. It really needs to be a mindset across. And and again, we have a CEO which very much fun of marketing and both brand and visual identity. So he understood this. But there was a lot of people that needed to like understand how do we use design, how do we do design practices in any way going forward. And it always helps to point to other companies who does it see you well. Mm -hmm. Compared to people who don't do design business, well, I feel so pretentious bringing up this, <laughs> but there's a reason for it. <coughs> in Luna, we have like all of that was focused like in a different office, and uh, our CEO has this giant wall of a lot of founders and startup uh, people. Like I think there's 50, um, 50 faces on that poster. I keep requesting people on that poster. Needs to know, needs to know all the cool guys who decided this is a good But I, I 
bringing him because I brought it to Luna also in the beginning because that also has this awesome quote that actually says it quite well that design is not what it looks like it's not only what it feels like it is how it works it's like the fundamental of the card that we want to use and we want to engage with and um, so I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here a bit but again I brought this because I use this exact slide to actually tell them how I see design practice how we turn, uh, <coughs> turn the investment to uh, reduce but first and foremost for any product, it needs to have like a core that's useful. We need to understand who are you creating it for and what are the needs, latent needs, pains, how do you solve it, how do you put it together, all of this. We have the relevant functionality. And you can't know this if you don't know your customers. Then you can have an idea of what you think they like, and then you build that, but you really have this core functionality. Then you need to wrap it and go into the information architecture or usability, support the mindset mm -hmm. of the action, so on and so forth. But that comes before we start talking about how it should look, how it should splash and be the light for everything else. You really need these two core elements of the onion before you start saying how it should it look like, how to that it. And then, then if you have those things ready and lined up and working and have a really, really good product, then it's also great to sort of brand it and tell the story of why it's great because people will relate to it and resonate with them. Um, so in my... Um, in my understanding, if this is uh, where design lives, and on purpose, the other circle found which will be big with some department or team effort is, is rather small. But I, I, I think the designer's superpower is the ability to facilitate a shared knowledge. Being able to pull different people together who have different mindsets, different understandings, experiences about the world, and make them see a common picture. And that could be a visual, it could be a process, it could be a map. You being at the center, helping everybody else to speak the same language, have something to point to. So it's no longer bullets on slides, but it's actually visuals, or words, or text that everybody has a common understanding about. That's where we belong. Because we have the ability to speak many voices. I mean, it sounds, so we can talk to you, so we can try and understand the problem space, who they are, what they need. We can challenge ourselves and our perceptions of it. We have a business who is meant to turn around good ideas into comfortable products. They also need to understand how users work, and they are, and they're always the most capable of that to be growing into that space and understanding it. And development, of course, needs good presentations, needs what they need. Also, what's the first product? What's the scale down version? What's the most important bit to develop first? Let's not start with the product, let's we'll start with the, the bit we know works, and then have a plan to continue to develop and so on. So, sitting in the middle between these three major domains, it's like the prime position you want to be in when you do design. Because that puts you in a position of power. That means that everybody needs you to fulfill the circle and be the center of attention and progress and also vision to have anything else they need to do to achieve. When I started at Luna, and we still have like amazing data set, we were lucky to be building a bank on some brand new architecture and systems. So that's super great. So we're very, very good on the whole data part. But this is very much back to my original statement on where they looked to find ideas and find issues. So just looking at what people do and how they behave and charts and drop off and so on, it tells you something, but it doesn't tell you the whole truth. It can give you assumptions, but it won't validate them. What you need to do is go in with this mix of data, analytics, and behavior, and really try and, and remove also the availability bias. So making bias based on what you have. Or what your experience is when you're often part. So, and I think the best example I actually have, I have mm -hmm. tons of examples on this, on how we brought together these two different two different truths into an actual understanding of the problem or solution. That when I initially started, I looked to our sign-up flow and our onboarding and activation a lot because I knew that was important. And we have below 30% from download installed to uh, application. So people who went through one of the people went through our onboarding flow or sign up flow like 78 or 79 to drop off someplace along that journey right and the data was very clear that they knew exactly where people dropped off it was this fucking mem ID <laughs> everybody hates mem ID look at the data oh shitty mem ID 
Remember, we have remember you have to rethink how to get rid of it, even though we need to re be regulated and we need to have it, but how can we? Everybody's just shouting at this <laughs> fucking thing that came from my government <laughs> that needed something because it didn't look good at it. I broke the experience and so on. Um, so that was interesting. So I had a lot of these like ideas on, on why we had such a big drop off in our China fund. And lo and behold, I went out and I just started a study. Like, you go out and talk to people. So I just, I think I had like 10 people sign up who didn't use Google before and just took them over their shoulders and followed along and they were thinking out loud and I was asking questions. Like, just having a conversation about them. And then uh, absolutely none of them hated me. <laughs> they actually all pretty much liked it. Yeah, because even though it's awkward, it's something we know. We know that when I usually might be script with primitive action, I'm like going from this might be cool, to, okay, I'm actually doing this. I'm, I'm selling my NMIT information into this company. I'm giving it the stem of approval. Um, so it's actually pretty great for confirmative and serious actions. And we have them throughout Luna, and I've never encountered anybody in our flows who has like you. In my DR, I don't want to do it. It's all about the feedback. Did not manage to tell you what Luna is exactly. That the instrument is a or something else, and why it's relevant. So people could download it, but they were like, "What's oh, happening? I don't know if I want to go through with this." They might be this pretty serious. I'm dropping that. And also, our whole business was being a second thing, and people don't understand it. They still do. A lot of people still think it's even possible to have two banks. So the thinking when you were just represented with this was. If I go ahead, will you then contact my old bank and tell them I'm cheating on them? And will you also like pull out their information, like cancel my membership with my other bank and what about all my loans and my NIPCONs and all of this? What happens? So that's so so much so much so much, so much anxiety, so many barriers with this. So data tool is one thing, politics is totally a whole other story. And we actually changed the whole wording on our page and the communication that Luna is the second bank we won't. We won't tell you all the things you can have two things. He didn't do that on Twitter. Okay, spending too much time for slides to actually get through this. So I'm trying to speak that. <laughs> so my main task, as I saw it at that time, was just putting users at the center of everything. Um, a really cool thing is that we had, um, and I, again, take away, I think you should all do this. It's super great. A long time ago, they made the Luna contribute to community, which is like an organic thing where, where people just uh, Join and, um, and then we have a community. So when I started, it was uh, half the size because we, uh, we we chose to engage more and actually also have conversations back and forth, but also giving purpose to what it was and trying to regulate how people used it. But this is just so cool to have like a giant platform of voluntary people just coming in to be able to be part of this and not Imagine having 1,300 people just available to send stuff out to. That's pretty great. Um, another thing which is pretty cool in Luna is that um, we have a bunch of, of principles and, and values, and I actually can't remember think of five, because the most important one is definitely the first one, and that is that we are customer obsessed. So what does that mean? It means a lot, but at least means it's a, it's a voice for everybody who works in design and product to say we really need to, to think customer first in everything that we do. And in Slack, we have different feedback channels, and that's Fucking brilliant because it allows everybody in the company to always have direct access to feedback from customer support, feedback from trust pilot app stores. It all just goes in there and people can tag it, they can tag each other, they can discuss it, they can pinpoint serious issues and so on. And that's a culture that we have a really smart platform. But I'll get back to the team and the culture again. Um, just a quick shout out uh, we use product for. I would, uh, if, if you have a lot of uh, feedback coming in and you want to start <laughs> it and and, and uh, like share it, take a look at Product Board. We did manage to make it work. I'm super sad about it because I loved it. But uh, again, just, uh, just uh, check it out. It's, it's really, really nice. Since it failed, I had to do something else because I didn't have a central place to place all of my feedback and, and work on it. So I, I'm really a huge fan of Notion and I've learned to love Notion uh, through my three years. I use it for everything, but it's also a central hub for everything in our design group. So we can place fun stuff and serious stuff in there. So I took all the findings I had from product board and I started mapping it in Notion instead, like using the structure of our app to like place all the nuggets and gems with the right position. And then I tagged everything with business impact, experience impact, and effort. 
So it's really ready to snap and start sorting it depending on whom I talk to. So that was pretty good. So we have this giant knowledge center with a lot of other stuff in there. But amongst that is all the um, all the feedback input. And I was really keen on not letting things slip between the correct because that happens because there's so many people and you don't have um, accountability and responsibility for everything just settled between different groups. So, yeah, can I just to set to filter it out based on the diff impact as well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You said, you said, I tried uh, okay. to the best of my knowledge to say oh, from a scale of one to ten how much the revenue is and our business impact changed in terms of what is is it sign up is most important, which KPIs it is right now it's revenue. So I would I would definitely try and feel yeah, but I gave you at least my my initial perception on how to do it. And everything I came across, I had a lot particularly in a Kanban board, also in Notion. To not let things fall between the cracks. So that could be weird messages, uh, wrong illustrations, like all of these small bits. So I could map it, I could hand it over to the right people at the right time. So that was a lot of work, but I really liked sorting it all out and, and having it pass uh, on. Another thing that was super great and I can't ex express enough that we should do this is to create a test tank, get that up and running. So we didn't have that. So we started building it, and every single person we interviewed or came in contact with, and so test questionnaires, whatever, we always invited them to be part of our UX collective. So they were passed on to a type form where they could fill in some basic information and give consent to us having their information for a period of time and so on. Um, so that's pretty great. We have a very large test collective or test panel, which we tag with a lot of different tags to be local, to should go to for what information. And that can be investing on crypto or savings and so on at their age and, and everything necessary to try and make a level system. Is that just an email away? And I've used them a lot to uh, get assistance on short terms. This, again, this book really helped me a lot in this space because we had to keep up. And we were not very many designers, and everything around it just exploded in the need of design because, again, we also put ourselves in the position of being the ones who facilitated the change by design. So, the science print, I, I saw it, I did my, my rocket fuel because, and, and this is really something I thought about a lot. We were literally, I think, you know, building the boat by the sail, so on. We were trying to catch together a rocket ship on this great space. There was so much going on. and and everybody was just working their heads so to, uh, to follow up. So I've done a lot of design scripts. I think we did 10 plus in just two years and Corona was out of that period. We did a lot of these and I really, really like it because it, it, it's it's about, as I say, maintaining velocity and making the most of people time. So you need input and you need to make people feel part of the change, be, be ambassadors for that change. Um, so at the science group, it's just super great to take the people together. Stick to the script. I've done so every single time. I think that it's nailed it. You can always improve on it. So we don't get all people in throughout the week, but uh, most of the stick to the script because it feels gets you on everything. And then I again document everything. I take pictures of everything, I catalog it afterwards in folders and files, so I can always retrieve it. And if it's gone back. Simple to me when I had to do new concepts and new things to like bring this up or we have this poster or we did things. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and also, every time we did a design sprint, I did a report that like summarized everything and the exact summary, which was super important. Like, the very disappeared in each one picture. And then, we mm -hmm. then treat it up without really all the good stuff we did. Again, a shout out, look back. We've used that a lot and it's super great. So it's uh, it's really a, a, a qualitative reporting tool. But the beautiful thing about it is that you can invite your stakeholders and your team and you know, everybody next to the whole squad to come in and observe in real time as we go through and use music can help put in the notes. We can easily export clips to make the reports. <laughs> All of this work we did for we need to know this and here's a nice bit of space. Most of it here's the links to all the different stuff we need to contribute. So really, really a big channel to look at, which is uh, to check that one out. 
another very good service that we use a lot is maze control formerly maze that design. It's like a survey, but you can implement your prototype within and create missions. So it kind of comes like an interactive survey, not just answering questions, you're actually engaging in the product and, and doing small bits of a flow. So it's super engaging. They create beautiful reports with heat maps and like UX findings within them also. And then um, it's perfect when you need a lot of responses because qualitative research is heavy and expensive. This gets you halfway there with a lot of responses. So I've done mazes with up to 650 people and non users just have to go through the maze and then uh, come back to the level. Also, great service to all of this over the side conference. I think it's really good. So you think you can upload the mean flow and get it evaluated, something like that? Sorry? Sorry, it was me. Oh, uh, hi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cool, though. I mean, I could, yeah. um, you can upload like a few steps and then you can test it. So if you good. make a, a prototype in uh, Figma, for instance, yeah. you can upload that whole thing and then you can say, well, click here, here, and here. Yeah. That ends the first mission. And yeah. then it, you start with this screen. But yeah, it's really you just make like interactive missions. It's mm -hmm. super good. Um, another thing that we, of course, we do continuous testing all the time and interviews and everything, but you need to like formalize it into something that's operational for everybody else in the company. Like they need to get to that society because we, we don't, we didn't necessarily know. We did a, we did a large study with Medimon who helped us a lot on this last, last year. Yeah, up until then, we had a very big idea about who are our users. That's troublesome, right? If you're creating products, we're creating them for, but that, that's the truth. We, we didn't have that, that clear image on who we're making products for, and neither are our expectation strategies of what should our products be to cater to additional needs. So we did the archetypes, and those are just super helpful. They are the truth of the archetypes, which I could cross people in, right? But it's just so helpful to talk about. And we made these really nice booklets that are facing different models so people can grab them and read them. So it's really good on aligning the organization, specifically with customer obsession. And what we use them for is very much anchored discussions and conversations. Right? Because you can go in many different directions, because having some point to it and something created can settle a lot of this stuff. Say, are we actually living like to that person? It looks a bit like this, there's a lot of pages in there. But I, lo I love this quote. My, uh, my experience director and you sent it to me not too long ago that all models are wrong but someone might use them and i think that is so true and i use models a lot but let's not present the truth either so we have people boxed in here but what was really interesting is that we on the basis of the whole study found like two metrics those are the one we can use to, to move forward Grab the rest let's make it plain and simple so that's something to jump on that peace of mind versus very high financial literacy versus low financial literacy. And just having those, that matrix made a lot clearer for us how we put in the products to different kinds of people. And operates up to the rationalization, it's a difficult word. It's just so important. So if something is important to you as a designer, make it work for everybody else. They need to incorporate in their work. They need to highlight and reference the word you did to basically to other people so you can move up the chain of importance of decision. Yeah. So we have this cheat sheet, which is pretty great. We can take a lot of complicated stuff and just try to simply, uh, simplify it so it's uh, operational. All right, so that was a, a bit on um, on tools and UX and how it works. So I have a, a bit there on, on leading design because I haven't actually had time to sit back and Think about my situation for the past few years before people reached out on us and I just made a long list of things that we went through and thoughts and all of this. So I tried to put it together in leading design. And one of the things I least did, I that all wasn't perfect. I had very little manager experience, just went along with my gut, what I saw my previous managers I looked up to had done. I thought I'll just take that and I'll just apply myself to it. Um, and I'm a very again. Try and analyze the world and break it down. So, like, what specific problems did we have? I've been with the organization for a year, and you know, a lot of things that were bothering me. I thought, yes, this is my chance to go and do something about it. So, this is actually a very raw and uh, honest um, in 
introduction to a slide that I did for the team at that time, just a few months into 2021. Um, and I talked with them about it and I tried to like get all the information I could on what was worrying them, what were their pains in the organization and the process, and I tried to put this together. So we had some main challenges. And again, trying to operationalize this vision and strategy into something that can be measured and can work on for part of my idea here. And um, I've censored some of them because, uh, yeah, it would be called it. But here are some of the other ones. We had very little collaboration with design and global data, and design and global data was mainly for anything and marketing. That, that was annoying, right? Because you have a full customer journey. The, the user doesn't like, break it down for us. They have like a full journey experience. But marketing and product were like two different worlds that didn't go a lot of things that felt very much dissimilar also. Uh, that was very, we were so bad at constructive criticism and good professional argumentation of why we do stuff. It's not, it looks like systems because it's breaking that rule, that law, or doesn't work in the system, and so on and so forth. So we need to be better at constructive criticism. Yes. We were also bottom in the practice, and we couldn't keep that up because the pace was so high. So what can we do to avoid being the bottlenecks? And, and a lot of that came for us. We spent way too much time on high fidelity stuff way too early before anything was actually settled. Like it was wasted effort. That didn't make any sense to me if you were to start somewhere else. Big man reality. Like do we, do we create a beautiful screen and then if we get like 80% of the flow or you only look to some chance scenario and we have like a billion cases we don't follow up on. Like and also maintenance, we could maintain the reality and the truth and we still can. We, we, we don't have that good goal of the actual truth of the app for our service. It lies in many different places and it's it's a problem that we're trying to solve. So this again, super honest. This is what I told them. I had some principles and ways of working that I would like for us to start uh, adopting and, and work on. So open door policy, uh, they could reach out to me at any time with all issues and, and I treat them like that. Uh, I wanted to introduce monthly retrospectives that turned into five months, three months, three months. Three months but uh, anyways, we use Python, which is a tool to figure out how well you're doing and uh, gather input on your employees. But please remember to fill that in and don't let shit drop a lot. Please come to me if there's something new. It's a small thing. Let's, let's deal with it in the beginning instead of only complicated things. Busy, busy, busy. So we're in hybrid growth. Everyone is very busy. We are too. That affects how we work, what's in scope, and our deadlines. When in doubt, ask. When stuck, let's help each other out. And deadlines are necessary. So please, if you can see that you're not meeting a deadline, it's okay, but tell me early on and why, and then we can solve it, and also for the next deadline. So we really needed, I had this concept of just in time designing. We simply needed to do that to be able to keep up with everybody who needed us to be able to complete their work. Otherwise, they would do it themselves, and that resulted in the process. Collaboration. And I really wanted to build a team spirit where we were a team and not individuals. And so, and that also brings insights that science throughout the whole thing that we like. So we needed to involve people, we need to listen more, we need to be inclusive. But also just let others feel know when they're awesome. You know, so that's a bit of a harsh culture where something was either super nice or it was an awesome, an awful chip. Like that was like these two colors and we didn't like it again I talk, talk about it. Again, this one, reference people and specifications and presentations. So remember to include everybody else, and that's also your buying. You are making other people a success in their job. Let them know when they are doing something great or they to get the honors or something. It's about including a very easy way to do it, but you get a lot of buy-in by, by telling that someone else is actually doing the author of something awesome or we are helping other people in a particular situation. Team skills are we had a very diverse set of companies um, and then this one, no one is an expert in all areas. We talked about the unicorn was there at the triangle of trust. We worked with the T-shaped profile and so on. But let's not kid ourselves. Let's, uh, let's join forces. So if someone's good at something and another person figured it out, then let's, let's, uh, let's empower each other and let's create a course and put the team together instead of trying to copy what everybody else is doing. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way. The work should be fun, but we need to make work count because we're too busy to do this work, basically. And 
yeah, so I wanted to bring in more conferences, and I did. Uh, people will stay open. Again, the culture. I needed a new culture where it was kind of like a bottle of trust. I needed people to go in with an idea, something that doesn't work, that looked like shit or because we had this high level of things would only be presented that it was extremely perfect. And that doesn't work. We can be uh, can be leave in any way doing that. So early feedback is invaluable. Be constructive, be nice, be supportive. New team members do now was isn't today, but was very testosterone driven. There was a lot of guys inside of the company and uh, kind of like so and so on was within the system. But have our users are female. So I wanted to I wanted to bring these people to the uh, team who were women. And I did not because they were women, yeah, fucking awesome as well, but I knew that I needed to get a, a nuanced uh, team team. Design system and guideline we have to be able to keep up, we have to put more focus to something systematic. So, um, yeah, I'll come back to that one. Surround yourself with brilliant people. So, none of what I achieved, I could have done on my own at all. That's a lot of things I lack at. And so, I had the astonishing pleasure of being able to hire a lot of really, really great people. So, nothing <laughs> done happens in the back of life. So, and that's that's the most joyful part of, of that year and a half is actually to inspire all the get to know them and yeah, befriend them as much as you can in a, in a working relation, right? And so we did a lot of fun stuff together, and, and Luna is super supportive in, in team events and everything. And um, but we also have pretty great structure things when it comes to decentralized, and we work on that uh, team planning or week planning all the time. So right now it looks like this for Fridays, we meet up for an hour, an hour and a half for inspiration, wins and learnings. We have quick sessions every Wednesday, where everybody can go in and pitch something and open a quick session on it. Then we do a bi-monthly retrospective and then um, have a lot of ad hoc workshops and sparing sessions because when we talk together, we learn that we need the help of one another and we set up all the control sessions. So even though we're decentralized, we do a lot to try and like create this bottle of trust to have this sacred space where we are designers and can do functional things. Super short, always had the webcam on. We tried a lot of different stuff. We work in different offices, we work in, uh, from home. And the most important bit is even if you're sitting in the same room, have the camera on on your computer facing you at all times. That's nothing more annoying than a group of people on, on the one webcam. So we'll save yourself all those uh, money on those cameras, rigs, and everything. Else. And again, you have to have the camera on unless you see because be yourself so so on. Um, so that has been very helpful. Okay, this one is um it's a bit of a tricky one because I won't go into depth with this at all because it was a two day call for me. That was a short version of it. But I will encourage everybody who either manages now or am looking to manage people. To have a look at situation in leadership, it really changed my whole perspective on leadership, and it's just uh, according to my um, mentor on this, it's uh, it's also the only real like uh, leadership. That's why I'm there. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's, it's just super great. I, I'm uh, again looking back on my previous managers and just taking away what I liked and try to implement that. I was a very big believer in trust and service. That is the one. But the micromanagement bills were yes. But even the most skilled people, even that badass designer that team was with company forever. If I put them on a brand new task where he's out there, out more, he will start needing more explicit direction and coaching to overcome that because he won't feel comfortable. Whereas if he's doing the design system, I just don't feel comfortable. So you need to understand when to be directed, when to back out. It gives you a lot of great guidelines on different management styles to different circumstances. And um, also, that, that isn't part of the leaders uh, of situational leadership. But just remembering the rule I uh, also brought from my former company, 369, where you hire someone in, it takes three months for them to even get up and running and have the things installed to understand a bit of what's going on. It takes six months for them to actually start being productive and understanding how they help out with such. Even even if they're awesome people come from great positions, other companies, then you drive that to your organization. And then it's like nine to 12 months to actually be as productive as they can be and like really start running with their craft and the thing that they do. So you need to have an understanding that you can hire someone in and they just do awesome work from day one. You need to give them a fair chance and set them up for success. 
We also do sort of PI profiles, because this profile is not fit in some other kind of like, ah, it might be in box build, uh, even though I like to box things in. Um, but I've used that a lot, and it's super helpful for me to try and understand who my team members are, like inherent strengths and weaknesses. But there's different parameters. And just because you have a PI profile doesn't mean that you can excel in everything. There's just some things that's much harder for you to start excelling at, and you'll spend much more energy on being like dominant in the workshop presentation if you're inherently collaborative and, and don't like like six cents and words. And so again, I would suggest you look into this, share yourself. I did that for a whole hour telling about who I was um, and, and how I had to act sometimes very much so uh, against my like, inner strength to present the role that I have. Um, and it's really nice for detecting stress symptoms uh, as well. Because if you're high on one of these, it's something you sorry, but if you're high on one of these, you will see that when people start acting low on the things they're high in, you need to start paying attention to the trust itself. Can you go one back? Uh, so is that an exercise to do side by side with uh, one of your team members? Yeah, uh, so it's super easy to do. You just get a link and you answer like two times 25, uh, you have to highlight 25. Things. Yeah, options. Yeah, options, yeah. And once you have that, you actually get the profile. It takes two minutes to get the profile. So you send it out to your team, let's say, to yeah. do it, and then, oh, okay. and then I get the result, and it's nice. And okay. yeah. But then what I did was that I gave everybody this one, and you have to fill, fill in five words in each column. That's super tricky. But to do that, you'll then you flip it down, and then you can see your profile again, and then you can start making an analysis of the two and that's combining them. And the third thing I did was that on a retreat, we have this one as well, a trust exercise, so people bring up with groups. So one person was sitting with the back to the other people, and they were discussing that person based on these and trying to define the five. So we actually have three sources of the profile, and then you can really start creating the truthful one in the world. Super much, it requires a lot of trust to be able to talk behind this back a little bit. But uh, it, was, it was really nice also for them, and they really loved the exercise because it we get a better understanding of how we work you know, how we structure teams and why someone is uh, not as structured as someone else, and that person might be way better than a race in the general mood. And I uh, have a, had a lot of really good coaching and training, and, and this is from a previous job. It's just a thing that I use a lot as my steering tool internally. I don't talk that much about it, but I'm a big believer in energy. That's not like spiritual, but, but just that there's energy, right? And, and then it's not a zero sum game. I can come to a group like today, I can raise the general energy within the room because I just bring in more. And if I made a good position, it's not something that drains me, it's something that just generates within the right? So good energy wraps up, be aware of what brings bad energy, and um, be uh, curious about what brings good energy to the group, to the individual, so you can kind of like harness that and like, build it up within the group. And so I, I'm not about smoking about it, but I think about it a lot. Um, how that works. Uh, Luna does a lot in, on mental health. We have mindfulness, we have a gym, we do breathing exercises. We, like, they, they're really spoiling us, as they truly are. But it's great, and I absolutely love it. And we have a performance book too, which is just great. Um, but I, I just one takeaway that everybody can do that I really love. I did it before coming in here today because it settles me. Everything in it settles within 30 seconds. It's called box breathing. It's also what the military does to try and calm down in special situations. And it's just breathe in for seconds, for the breath for seconds, breathe out for seconds, for the breath for seconds. Doing that uh, four or five times just calms my entire body down. So I do that when I feel stressed or if I have to do a presentation or anything else, I just like calm myself up. Super simple. Don't need to read up and just do it. One to one, she also briefly covered it. So I had to set up one to ones with all my directs. And at the time, it was 16 people, 15 people. Um, and I wanted to do it often. And, and I did. And it was tough, but it was super nice. And I won't go too much into one to ones, because you all know that. But I used this, uh, this smart goal thing, which was super nice because it, it allowed me to sketch out where we were to address what we talked about before. So I had like, um, I had for each one-to-one, -one, I had like uh, five persons I went to, and one of them was uh, how did we build our previous goal that we set up together. So it could be a professional thing, it could be a personal development thing, 
they could beat them more dominant in in uh, in group facilities and so on. Uh, but that was really great, and again, it, it gave a framework where we're going to work on an understand where that work just the feeling of progress and not be diminished by talking about isolation. He can reduce that. And the only thing I'll say about it is that uh, I think it's great. It won't tell the whole truth, but it's the definite best voice of everybody in the company because our CEO reads all comments. Like he's also insane in team, but he reads everything. But if you want to voice something, that's actually the best platform to do so. But it can stand alone, of course, speak to your people. And I used to share a lot with my team on our Friday meeting, like where we at, what are our main concerns. Workload was always one of them. I, I knew that when we start working on that specific one, we were trying to democratize what was important in the team. Um, just a quick one again. I had I had this say about bitch about it, but then we then uh, which I tried to enforce. So yes, everybody needs to voice their frustrations, and it's totally cool, and we're all people and we can have a bad day and so on. But if things keep bothering you, either do something about it or learn to live. Don't keep draining the energy of the problem. Don't mess up. Because you can always do something. And if you're not willing to do even the slightest thing, then I don't think it's worth doing. Like move on. So we had like a big, we were doing this project through, or turn off this project through, where we were going to use your car to uh, donate to uh, ocean cleanup. And we had so, we knew we wanted to do something like this. We had the formula and what we wanted to do. We just couldn't agree on if it should be something about CO2 compensation, or we should plant trees, or we should be in the ocean. And at one point, I was like, fuck it, I'm just walking across the street to we have the library in all for the garden. And I just started interviewing people on what was most important to them, which state were originally the best. And uh, ocean cleanup, definitely one. So that settled it, right? And that was just a gorilla test. It took me an hour and I said, like, hours of discussion of just having relevant data available. Last, um, you put out a tea silence on the uh, no, uh, on prints, okay. okay. um, so one of the things I also mentioned earlier on was that the science system that it's too important to not do something about to be like a productive wheel or an engine. So we spend a lot of time on it, we discuss it a lot, it's also professional stuff, it's great, we love it, it doesn't matter. Um, but you really need to extend the design system uh, beyond the design team. It needs to be adopted and used and worked on and understood by everybody who works in product development. So that was the two main goals for a system. It was one, that we start using as design team, and that's Operation Purple Wing. So if you actually use the component assets from, from Matter, they'll turn up purple in the list of assets. So we had this rule of getting up to 80. When we delivered the science, 80% of all your assets should be purple. So that was operation perfect. And the other big goal was getting this collaboration up and running with developers, talking with the mobile guild, have them buy into it, have this conversation back and forth, and they can also influence the system. And that we also succeeded with. And I hell of that. So it should be when we did all the hard work. And Sigma, just if you aren't using it, it's not useful because it's super, super awesome. And, and like we use the sketch and the Zeppelin and a lot of other stuff. And Jesus, this has just made everything much easier, especially because the structure of it, if you can put together a good structure to support your work process, you can also influence how the whole company works. If you have the central tool that everybody is using, counting on, and we have that with Sigma, everybody's using it. It is what all things point towards also slides, but, like, but, but the product development and where we're at, and from basic ideas to finalized design concepts, it's in big map. And the most sacred and holy one is our ready for data. That is where we sit with our team as designers and developers and product managers and put each other in the eye and say, This is what we're doing. This is the truth. This is what it should look like when it's final and it's coming out of development. And we can all agree to it because we've all been part of the process. We had time to do feedback. We've done iterations on it. But when we put it into ready for them, that is what we're building. But it's a nice story, right? And everybody buys into that. This is a sacred move to put it up here. Um, and that helps because that's also my QA file, right? 
because then that much I can start going through the design and do screen checking and then put it up against um, the ready for their product. So that is super good. Um, always, always, always keep explaining what design is and what's the value of it. Uh, we had a, a really great guy when we started our hybrid world coming in and talking about hybrid world from another company, and he kept reiterating, keep uh, uh, keep marketing your products. The same but just because the whole product is keep marketing it's something new. Just keep on doing it, and it was kind of because all the new people coming to your product, all the new people coming to your business, they don't know it. All the new people here of your company for the first time, they don't know that old product you have on shelf there. So introduce it again, make it nice, just keep on selling it. And it's the same with design. So at one time, I had the opportunity to like make a big announcement that we were going from product design to experience design. Because we no longer wanted to be a leg on product. We wanted to be something that the total experience like from A to C. And that lens, understanding and defining proper spaces, exploring opportunities, have that deep understanding of users. That can be done with a product first mindset. We need like we need to go uh, go about it with uh, some, some design tools. Uh, so that was uh, that was great. And uh, I also had the chance to have one to ones with so many of our new people coming in again because I put myself in a position where everybody who was party to those people said, "You need to meet Casper. He's running the design team." They were giving instructions how we use design and so on. And even though it was painfully many hours of one to ones with a lot of people, I wouldn't not do it for anything because it allowed me to get position myself, my design team, at the very same time. And if we aren't there, we'll be called on who wants to define. What gets measured gets managed. That is very true to be part of defining what should be measured. I do it very practically. With sitting down, for instance, here with our PM Teresa, going through all our updated designs on this pay later, so updates to that product. And screen by screen, we agree on what would be nice to see when this goes live. That could be updates in clicks. It could also be validation that that people trust in the things and that would require qualitative research or quality testing. So, so we're a big part of actually defining what we should look like because. That's not only the hard KPIs, the revenue, the you know, all the hard KPIs, right? There's also all the soft stuff that, that touches people and, and changes your whole perception of the product more one. Pragmatic excellence is a term I, I use a lot. Uh, I don't know if I find it. I haven't heard it anywhere else, but I can see on Google that it exists at least. But just like trying to let things go, and that's hard on me because I like being in control of everything. But it, it's just, it's not manageable to try and control everything. And it will never be perfect. I mean, we can always do a knowledge race. We can always learn something more. And every time we do a knowledge race, we will also question something new because we learn something new. Right? At some point, we just need to have that trust feeling that says, I believe in this now. I feel like I've answered all my questions. I have enough information at least to feel 90 to 95% validated. This is the right direction. Let's go to something small. Let's move with it. Let's come back to it. Be more explicit. So that's that stuff up. And, and I have a lot of, and it's really hard for me to, to say this, but like, I have sometimes uh, learned to live with design sometimes as it's like Thomas, right? If, if, you, if you don't know how to put them, if, if the, those people know how to put it in a comma and a sentence, but they're like, ah. And then first the eyes, and first the pride, and the first the readability of the sentence, right? If, if you put, if you were strict about commas, but only like, Five percent of the population will actually notice if there's a height difference between stuff, or if somehow you present an image with specific fields over here will look the same. So pick your battles and, and decide which hills to die on. There are very important hills that you should try and die on, but not everything is important, and, and that was really big learning for me. We made some principles, and I'm not going go into depth with them, just it's super nice to get together for a day, you define as a team what what makes you tick, what, what, should, what should you represent. So we make these five principles and we sometimes use these as guide conversations and discussions. Do we remember to be transparent, simple, the article? So this is just a nice exercise I would, I would recommend. Remember to speak business. 
I think again, coming back to having impact as a designer or as a design team, you really need to address people in a voice and a language they understand. So again, they have also like objectives and directions for success. So speak to them so you become part of their success and you enable them to achieve their goals. So start with desirable, figure out how do we make something that works in this way, but understand what it takes to actually build it and be able to speak that so they get the full truth of what impact will it have, how expensive it is to build it, like so on and so on. I try and fill in the gaps just because we design us doesn't mean we can't solve business case. We can affect the business case with other metrics than the typical sheet. So like like involve yourself and again try and be part of that like middle sort of stuff. Quick design front and center, I I'll just repeat myself. I think it's the biggest change we have to make impact. It is to be smack in the middle of everything that's happening. So people are reliant on you, your input, your team, to actually move forward with progression, validation, comfort, and everything else that your team stands for. So be indispensable. And that's very much about facilitation. Like, that's key. So nice to be able to do very nice design, but you're not able to like, Gather a group of people and rally behind an idea that you help build and put into, into the world, then it won't matter much. And that's why apply your methods. I have a bunch of these. One of my professional hobbies is to collect methods and, and use them. Um, so I, I use that a lot. And some of them are super simple, but they just put you in a position where you're the one asking questions, you're the one putting things down, defining things. And um, so not everything should be left to the PM, I think the designer can take on a lot of. Responsibility and use the design tools to, to do things. Uh, I really love the uh, lean UX canvas only because of the last sentence. How it's great, all in all, you get some assumptions out of it. But what's the cheapest way of validating the most important assumption? That's a great fucking right? idea. Also for design, but also for business. They're like, yes, what can we do to move ahead with the confidence that the cheapest possible you can see of the time? Right? So I really like that one. Be aware of the uh, Responsible, accountable, consulted, informed. I always do this on my projects. Who do I need to bring in? Who have I consulted? Who's the responsible and accountable one? So I know how to address different people and summarize it. And I'm also in charge of the question sheet. So I note down everything I have in terms of questions. I structure it out in Notion and tag it because then I'm in control of figuring out what we need to answer, where our blank spots and so on. So it's in collaboration with everybody else and also the PM. But it just again puts me in a position where I am the one I facilitate the best they hold for. Last night for me, this was, um, I was so proud when I got this. It was a year in, and I'm holding back my face right now. It was, it was the toughest year ever in my work, professional life, going from getting the head of design gig to looking at the Christmas break last year. And just giving that recognition from the group is just that, that made it all work. I still don't know about the, the colas. I haven't figured out why I, why I got four colas. I have two children and a wife, so maybe that's not the case. But I mean, so yeah, that only was, Christmas. If they yeah. have a only jolly Christmas. Ah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's it. On the, uh, yeah it's coming by the end of the Yeah, so that's, uh, that was the highlight of, of my year. Yeah. Thank you so much. Whoa. Uh, yeah. A lot of info. Yeah. <laughs> just we just start with, with the question. Uh, I have one thing. Um, you know, I I'm quite weird in the sense that I I started out as an engineer, mm -hmm. then became designer, and then kind of project manager, and then manager of kind of, right. So I'm all over the place, right? Yeah. But um. I'm just thinking about, you know, that does everything have to be born in computer or can a, a engineer just start out and then you can put the sign on that one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, good ideas can come from all over, right? Yeah. They can come from data, it come from, we, we had an idea come from finance, right? We needed, <laughs> we needed a capital, we have to do stuff, but like we need capital, okay, let's figure out how to do that. So, so good idea arises everywhere. But also, who starts the execution? Do you need to do a big nice design file? For the oh, no, no. Not at all. So, but, but we need to do something. And yeah. so I always, always not everything with a keyboard. 
I need to get everybody in the room, everybody with stakeholder has a stake in it, needs to get together and just get a reality. What is it? What are our assumptions? What are we looking to? What do we need? Sometimes it needs die hard research, other times it's an update to something existing, which is just validate. But I always, always, always have to keep on. And is that always you, or can it be somebody else with a product manager, or uh, uh, usually someone on the design team? Yeah. Because our product managers, are all, some of them are super great, and some of them are not so skilled in facilitation. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really, again, I think it's the superpower of uh, a designer who has that trait at least who wants to to stand in front of the whiteboard mm -hmm. and share that. With them. This really really helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? That's one. That's one. Yeah, one. No, I think it was the oh, what he asked afterwards. Oh, okay. Ran out of budget in the room. Yeah. I mean, that, that sounds too good. I guess one of the ones that that's established that 600 people is going to stay, right? But how did you get the buy? I mean, if you said first, like with 60 people, this atmosphere, this, this design driven approach was in there. Yeah. And convincing 60 people about anything. It, no, uh, yeah, we were about 80, 90 people when I started, and then we got a uh, really big funding. Uh, uh, we got the banking license just before I started, and then in the spring, we got a major funding. I can't remember how much like the normal people come along. So, and the investors had a lot of talking about what does this mean, and that was growth, 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 growth. We needed to grow. Also, on the expense of revenue and everything else, about, not about being profitable, about growing as a company. So that's kind of like what kickstarted it, right? And everybody was just growing and, and had growth. I'll say, I would, wouldn't say KPI, but we knew we needed to grow so we could do more. Does that answer your question? Well, I guess so. Yeah. I'm, 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 I really admire how thoroughly you seem to have documented everything, written things down, captured all the decisions that we really made, all the research, like all, all those details. And um, it's it's something I've I've struggled with um, in, in some roles I've had over the years. Um, did you find that there was a trade-off between doing that and going at the high speed that you were describing? Or did you think it was essential in order to maintain that speed over time? Not everything I did was essential. And that's the day I put in my fair share of hours and energy into mm -hmm. the in this period. It was, it was but I knew that I wanted, I knew I had to be part of the change I wanted to see. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I needed to do this to be able to put myself in that position. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I just, I just went all in basically mm -hmm. for a year and a half. Yeah. I can't say much more. I think yeah, it's, a, it's a very sort of, I mean, I, 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 my last new job was uh, at Wings. Yeah. I all, all started, I think, for 40 or something. Uh, and when I left with 450, and, um, and I mean, I can just cross off so many things, it's just the same thing, right? But what, and I was the CPO and CTO, and what I think people are talking about, or maybe it's better now, I know it's there's certainly better alignment. Uh, I talked about how do you handle alignment across a lot of teams? Is that necessary? Uh, and how do you keep that in check with empowerment and autonomy? Yeah. So, Good ideas can uh, come from above, or they can rise from below, yeah. and they did both. Yeah. But a lot of them came from the top of yeah. that. That's like one thing, right? We also had a lot of shifts in focus, yeah. which killed kind of our adaptability and yeah. progress. Um, Christian, I'm sorry. So, like, how? So, there's I think, I think also that uh, like the common thing you need to tackle is the balance between autonomy and alignment. And I think you know, either you can go full on alignment. By no autonomy, then it's top down, life management. Yeah, yeah. That's hard to scale. Yeah. So, when you have a, a scale of hyper growth, somebody, I mean, you can't be all over. Right? No, so, no. So, you need then autonomy to be able to, uh, to yeah, yeah, let yeah, people yeah. Uh, think and for themselves. But then, in the beginning, you would lose alignment, and then you need to recreate it, right? So, it's like this weird journey. Like, how do you balance autonomy and alignment? I think we could have been better at the, how I see it, it's actually in my two points about um, um about um setting clear objectives yeah. and and uh, agreeing on what success looks like yeah. but leaving up to the team to figure out how to get yeah. i had the same with my team and if, if 
we have a, a thing we need to do, a design task at hand, no one tells you how to do it. It's completely up to you. I'm a research now, essentially going to doing a, a big uh, probe, design probe study. That's a big task, uh, sending out a lot of stuff and following up. But if that's what it needs to be able to complete the task, then fine. So we have, we have we need to have some deadlines. The uh, people are accountable. Okay. Yeah, and they, they rely on us to deliver stuff and so everybody can keep moving right. But how you come about your work, that, yeah. that's up to you. And we have the squad structures and they are dependent on business, but they also have some autonomy, right? And yeah. figuring out how we just need clear common goals yeah. and objectives and B hacks. Yeah. So you are I guess as a designer in the middle of that. Yeah, I yeah. that's right. And we could do a whole study also on strategy. Yeah. As a, how, how can we use design to inform strategy and impact it? I think that's super interesting because that's taking up even another level. Yeah. We can design more into the conversation. But that's a whole lot of stuff. And now you are not an engineer anymore. Now I'm uh, just a designer. But how, is, design. how is that? Uh, I have less to do. It was, it was a, a big, uh, yeah. I still need to pass on to. I got a I got a new boss in, in Andrew, who is a great guy, design director now. So I need to pass on a lot of stuff to him or bring him up to speed. And so there's a long transition period. Uh, but now I have less good calendar and more time to do iterations and design work. It's nice. I uh, really like doing design work. Yeah. Um, so good, good coming back. Yeah. But but I'm still practicing all the facilitation and the feedback. Things you talked about where I'm, I'm trying to meddle wherever I can. Any other questions? Um, I actually have a question for that one. Uh, okay. Because it okay. sounds to me like you're working a lot, but it sounds to me like you're taking the less, you're going to be less in positions where you're going to make short, short calling just because there are a lot of people managing anymore. Mm, no, because I think the principle is something to know. Yes, I want to see that there's nothing beyond this, but I don't know what my next step is. No, I don't know. Senior principal. But, um, <laughs> but no, I, what I have now is uh, that I'm not embedded in a squad or, or a vertical of any kind. Mm -hmm. So I work on big strategic initiatives, and that is also defined in the very beginning. So it's actually back to having an explosion goal. That's, that's great. I, I want to work on what the most important thing. Because, uh, I think uh, really, uh, really, uh, really the choice of mm -hmm. them saying I'm going to take a break or maybe I'm coming back, maybe I'm not, but actually, you know. It, it was an easy choice also because yeah. we have two new managers now doing this, just the manager part of what I did before. So Andrew was very clear with me, you have too many directs, you are overworked, you need to either do manager only or do assignment. Yeah. Thanks. Just love my people so much. It was, it, uh, I, I feel a bit sidelined now because I, I don't have interaction with anybody all the time. That's, that's super, super hard. But I'm a better designer. I'm a better UX designer than I'm a better I, I, I really remember, like, I had that conversation with a lot of people, you know. I remember one person uh, in my first job said, you know, I've been a senior designer for 10 years. I don't want to be a manager. Yeah, like but, what, what, what's there for me now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's that's a hard sell. Yeah, if, if you're a manager and like what's the next thing? But maybe you know, it's just doing awesome stuff and being better. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that's the that's the, the thing. I really like the slide on, on the business thing with the with the dollars on the money, right? And and in, from my point of view and what I can see, everybody everywhere else in the industry, if you go towards the craft, there's less money to go towards strategy. There's more. Amazing. But that's actually my point because I think, I think that's a misconception because you can't have people who, like if you're people manager, you, then you're also on the team to think in person. No, 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 I think that's actually yeah. where the we, I think there's still this misconception that oh, you have to actually get to that community yeah, thing where you have to go to people track. Yeah. Where I think actually it would be much better if you focus in on like what actually brings in the money, we would be better in that conversation sometimes. Yeah. And, Plus, I think when you're growing so fast. Uh, you are out of pants, and what you actually need is, is somebody with head space, yeah. I think, because you're, you're so busy and having so many direct reports, so everybody who's making decisions are just out of time, right? Oh, yeah. I, I started in this bad growth room, so I have this 20 80 relationship. Yeah, so I could do the same work. Yeah. 
that's which is not pretty pretty right because it was impossible. So I still did a lot of IC work, but I had less time to do it. So yeah, let's get it right the first time. Okay, so we didn't necessarily do that. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Changing a little bit back uh, the topic to the growth. Um, so you talked about growing the science team. How did you manage to grow it together with the growth of the engineering team? How was that? It's synchronous, I would say. So we had a lot of talks on on how we distribute ourselves, what our organization should look like. We're still having those talks. It yeah. isn't settled at all. It's been causing more confusion than it has been, been clear. Uh, so it goes through a lot of struggles. So I just I would just see the rise in the number of developers in which was and of course I want to have the design groups and, and most of those was all those with front end things. I needed to have someone in there to, to speak moving on. Yeah. And to that point, I think there's a little bit of that's why two organizations where they did the differently. One where you wouldn't sit at the table and you would actually experience the same thing. All of a sudden there's like a hiring plan for developers and you were just there, oh fuck, what do I need to do? Or the other way around is to actually sit and say, like, hey, let's look at this as we are organized, we're designing this together. And then you're actually saying, this new spot needs to come, what does it consist of, what is the needs? And then that's, that's, that's yeah, that's, 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 that's a good way to like go. functional, right? No, but not only that, you can also say, hey, you're going to have an uh, API team. Ooh. That doesn't mean yeah. that you have to open design. No, no. Um, but that means that, okay, I'm okay. And then you can also communicate that back to the design team saying, like, yeah, it's going to be a new team, but we are not needed as much. Yeah, um, it's also super fluent. So, so we, so we first Mike decided how those squads should be stood up. So I stood up a squad with the Anas Frank, your friend, and also Mensa on the program. Uh, we knew we wanted to do something for. Uh, we had like this missing link of, of the marketing product, like the, the, the finding gap. So we stood up a squad in Copenhagen, and I hired a designer in to take on that position for all right. And I also needed someone to work on Houston, which is our whole custom management platform we build ourselves. And it hasn't gotten any love for six years, and it's critical. So I also hired in the designer just to do internal uh, updates on that and ensure that we have the right thing. I had a lot of freedom working in my car. Yeah. What if someone makes someone else is from the person? So I have a. I just brought along my my working uh, relation from my previous company, mm -hmm. um, where you have the very boxy life with the double diamond, you know, do it in the diamond, and we have sort of we are having the second double dish kind of life, right? So. I would also always try and figure out what the solution would be like and spec everything out and all of that. Or maybe also wireframe something. I could also have the conversations with clients and so on. But I always knew when I handed it over to Nicholas, just made everything way better, right? And that's such. So we had that work with it. We had a lot of sparing on the general things, but I've kind of like took precipitation and made design ready. And he made it high fidelity and all the news we and the whole CPI and identity and how to put it in that product and all of this. But that's my very good definition of you and you and you. That's, that's how it worked also until we grew a lot. And now we have a lot of different profiles with a lot of different skills. So we try to implement the C profile thing. So what are you good at? And how to start with some news. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the awesome presentation. First of all, um, I have a, a question. You mentioned that you're, you know, you're gathering a lot of insights, customer insights, and I'm assuming that the designer and their team are doing the same thing. How do you share knowledge when it comes to customer customer insights? So, one thing is our weekly sessions, yeah, where we can briefly touch on what we've learned. So not necessarily the whole thing, but at least these are the highlights and go here. We also have specific sessions about research your hands, because it's made a, a large piece of the body of work or something important. And if you have a session on that, we can explain what we've learned. And so we do it uh, when we get together and, and try to take the most important bits and know where to find the rest and then set up these ad hoc sessions if you need something. 
So I, I'm, I'm just starting on a new project, for instance. And I know that Johannes and Daniel, who are researchers now, they might become something that's important to me, but they were also user side, but just reach out to me and say, hey, I'm very clear at this question. Right. It's also ad hoc, but we, we keep everything in, in, uh, in Notion and get pretty good reports on how to perform, how to summarize it, and then it's kind of streamlined. And Notion is also super great for us for onboarding new designers because that's a welcome guide and this is what you do and here you design stuff and so on. So, like, yeah, getting people up to speed. I think that's the yeah. That, uh, yeah. Christoph, right. did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I just uh, regarding the career path where you can get up to like a principal as an individual contributor. Is that a thing at Luna where you can is there, like multiple disciplines or yes. other multiple principal yeah, yeah, yeah. designers as well? It's um, so we got this new CPO in last year, they really great guy who also came with a lot of like from product perspective design is the part of things. And then I got Andrew uh, last December. And they've kind of been working on this model on how can you ladder up. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a Y shaped, right? So junior, probably senior, mm -hmm. straight out, head off, director, mm -hmm. principal, senior principal. Mm -hmm. I just want to be CA, so <laughs> it, it isn't it isn't that yet that position. Yeah, maybe one. All right, I think that's it. Yeah, Thank you so much.